morning. Welcome to Rose Hill Alliance Church. We're glad you're working, worshiping with us today. Hopefully you're not working with us today. Uh, we're glad you're here with us. If you are visiting with us for the first time, we want to encourage you to take the welcome card that's right in front of you. There's a picture of it on the screen right behind me there. Uh, grab that. Uh, we would love to connect with you more. Um, find ways that we can just learn who you are. Uh, we want to know um, just who you are, how we can help you get connected with our church. So if you want to fill that out, you can bring it to our Welcome Center just right out here. We have a gift for you. Um, if you are maybe a returning person or a common, a, you come on a regular basis. Words are apparently, again, not my friend today. Um, if you come on a regular basis, we also would love to connect with you on maybe prayer requests, an updated address. Maybe you have an updated email address. Um, and we would love to connect with you more on that. So if you have those, we, you can use that and just put it in the offering box in the back. And then speaking of the offering box in the back, you can use that to give your tithes and offerings for those of you who are regular attenders as well. Uh, so this past week, we've had a very busy week. Um, many of you helped with our soccer camp this last week. 
Um, soccer camp had 52 kids throughout the whole week, which is absolutely awesome. So we had a few minor injuries or minor things here and there and nothing that grew into anything serious, so that was great. We could feel God's hand of protection there. And God works in amazing ways. At the end of the week, we gave Bibles to kids who uh, wanted one, don't have one at home. And so I had 18 Bibles downstairs in the cabinet ready to hand out, and there were 18 kids who wanted a Bible at the end of the week. So it's awesome how God works in that kind of a way. Uh, we're hoping those Bibles get home and opened and read, um, but at least they're in these kids' homes. So that's part of the battle right there. Um, and then today also, we want to let you know about the annual meeting coming up next Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, July 13th. And so next Wednesday, you're welcome to come. That's a time that we gather to talk about what happened this past year and then also to look forward to the next year as well. Uh, we do need a quorum for that meeting, so members, we want to encourage you to come uh, just so that way we can get everything voted on that needs to be voted for that night. Um, and then one last announcement that I have for us. Um, we have gotten to the point where we, have, um, we get to send groups of people out this week, and I'm so excited about this. Uh, we have Lizzie uh, Speltz, who is going to Germany this week as part of the English camp. Uh, we've had this partnership with them for a few years. Um, haven't been able to send people the last couple of years, and so Lizzie has the opportunity this year to go. I'm going to ask Lizzie to stand wherever she is at, right here in front of me. And then we also get to send our students to the LIFE conference. Um, and the LIFE conference is this week from Monday until the following Monday they get back. Um, they're gone for eight days. The conference itself runs from Tuesday to Saturday. And then we also have a few people who are not necessarily with the group from our church, but are working at the LIFE conference as well. So I want to encourage all of you who are going to the LIFE conference this week, if you would stand up so we can recognize who you are. So we have our students who are going, our volunteers, our leaders who are going, and then Molly is going as part of the prayer experience there. And so she is running a station where students get to experience prayer in many different ways. And then Christina is going as part of the Envision team, where she will get to share different things about Envision, um, help students get connected so that way they can plan missions trips and different things for the next year or so. So we just want to invite all of you to stand again. We can have everybody stand up. Maybe if you're going on a trip, just raise your hand so that way we know who you are. But everybody stand. Everybody stand. But if you're going on the trip, we want to just encourage you to raise your hand so people can see where you are. And so we're going to take a couple of minutes just to uh, pray over these people as they go. So we might need some of you maybe to move over this way so people can pray for you if you're okay with that. And if you're not, they'll just pray loudly from where they're at. Um, but let's take a few minutes and just pray over these people as they go. Lizzie going to Germany, and then the students and volunteers who are going to the LIFE conference. And I will pray for us after a few minutes.
Jesus, I thank you that we are able to send these students and these people who are going to the conference, to Germany, to help people know who you are. I pray that you would fill them with yourself, um, that they would just experience you in a new way through this, uh, the trip, the conference, and then also through going to Germany as well, God, that you would just fill them with yourself, that they would experience more of you, more of who you are, um, that you would just bless them, keep them safe as they go. Uh, we pray your hand of blessing over these people, God, that you would just be present with them, that they would know more of who you are, they would experience you in new ways, that if you have a call for them, God, that you would make that known to them. And I just thank you so much that you are with us, that we are dependent on you, God, for everything. And I just pray that you would go with everyone as they go this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Let's um, find our spots and, and let's worship the Lord this morning. It's good to be with you.
Amen. I feel like we need a big choir for that song, right? That would make it even better. Lord, thank you for the work that you have established here at Rose Hill Line Church. I think of the things that have happened this week at soccer camp. I think of the garden and all, all the work that's been happening there. I think of the work that you have established through doing soul care in our lives. And as we dig, dig out the roots of ourselves, um, our wills that we need to let go of. Jesus, praise you for that work. Praise you for the work that you have already established in us. And Lord, we, we look expectantly and we are excited for, for even the further work that you are going to do here at Rose Hill Lions Church and personally in each one of us, Lord. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's so
a minute and you can do this out loud or you can do this in your mind, but praise the Lord. What is it today that you want to use your voice and your prayers to praise the Lord? How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountains I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name.
somewhat of a weekend of rest, and tomorrow is a day of rest nationally. Lord Jesus, the concept of work and rest and that rhythm in our lives is so, so apparent and so fresh now through your work on the cross. Jesus, we thank you that because of the completed work that you did, that we can rest in you. So Lord, whatever work you have for us this week, wherever you have called us into whatever community we might, it might be that we live in, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that we can enter into those spaces, into those places, into those communities, bringing your presence, knowing full well that you have work for us to do, but also knowing that that work has been completed at the cross. So Jesus, we thank you for the hope. We thank you for the hope that we have as your followers. We thank you for the hope that we carry. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we can rest that you do the work and somehow in all of this, Lord Jesus, you'll make things right. So we praise you. Thank you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. We're going to greet one another really quickly. We're going to be doing communion today, so a bit of a confessional. Talk to one another and uh, answer the question, did you buy illegal fireworks for this week? That's what I want to hear. So... Will you join me in singing the children's blessing as they walk out to children's church? May your life be morning, uh, we're going to have the privilege of listening to uh, Derek Stavum share the message with us today as we talk about vision. So this is Derek Stavum. He's one of the elders of our church. And uh, Derek, can I pray for you? No. Get started. 
Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for Derek. I want to thank you for uh, his willingness to lead in this, Father. As you are bringing change into our church and as you are calling us into new places and in new spaces, Father, um, you have given us a fresh vision. I pray this morning that you would just anoint Derek, that you would bless him, Lord. You've given him the words, but Father, I pray that you would anoint him and fill him to the uttermost with your spirit. So, Father, open up our hearts to your word. Open us, our hearts, to what Derek has prepared, I pray. And I pray that you would just continue to do the work um, even more so, starting today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thank you for that introduction. I feel like... And the prayer, I feel like uh, sometimes I've had to introduce myself, so maybe I need a special measure of prayer here today, we'll see. So, um, Again, as Eric said, I'm Derek Stavum, I'm one of the elders here at Rose Hill, and over the next five weeks, uh, we'll be going through vision and values um, here at Rose Hill, and so today I get to kick us off by talking through our vision. And so this was presented a few months back, but uh, this is just a chance now over the next few weeks to go into these things in more depth. And so to start off, I'd like to start off by defining what do we mean by the word vision. I think each of us might have a meaning that we um, adhere to or a preferred meaning of what we think our vision is, uh, uh, what vision is defined as. But for us today, as we talk about vision, I'd like us to think of this as our preferred future. So this is... Not where we are today, although we may see glimmers of this. We've definitely seen a lot of movement in our lives over the last years and the past year uh, towards this vision. Um, But this is still where we want to go, and we want to go there together. And so, again, I'd like us to think of that as our preferred future. So today, as I start, I'd like to just invite us to climb aboard, strap in, secure your belongings. We're going to go on a journey together. Um, And so here we go. So our vision statement, just to start us off, our vision statement is to see our communities transformed by the presence of Jesus. We want to live out our faith in such a way as to see transformation in the world around us. So to think of this vision in different terms, I like to think of how uh, Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 17 are described. So by this point in the book of Acts, they've uh, established a bit of a reputation for themselves, Paul and Silas and uh, the other Christ followers. They go from place to place. They're preaching about a king who's greater than Caesar. They're preaching about a Messiah. So they're not only uh, going against the secular authorities, they're also going against the religious authorities in these cities from town to town. And so they've, they've had it rough. They've been imprisoned, they've been beaten, they've been threatened to the point of death. And then in Acts chapter 17, they come to this city and a riot starts. A mob forms, a riot starts. They're looking for Paul and Silas and they say, we're looking for these people who have turned the world upside down. And they meant it as a bad thing. These people who have turned the world upside down But isn't that exactly what we as Christians are called to do? We're called to be people who turn the world upside down. We're called to see our communities transformed by the presence of Jesus. So we're committed to turning the world upside down. Because when Jesus is present in a community, lives are changed. Power structures are flipped. People's values are upended. Jesus' presence transforms communities. So when I was asked to speak about this vision statement today, a couple of texts from Samuel came to mind, and they might be a bit surprising, um, but I invite you to turn with me there as we dig into them. So if you turn to the book of 1 Samuel, we'll be starting in chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5, you've got pew Bibles in front of you if you need, or you can look it up on your device, or it will be up on the screen as well. Um, But while you're turning there, 1 Samuel chapter 5, I'll, let me share a little context. This passage is about the Ark of God or the Ark of the Covenant. It has a few different names. Um, but it's this special place, this kind of elaborate box that was designed to where God's presence was expressly manifest. Um, they put it in the tabernacle when they were in the phase of their history in the tabernacle or in the temple, and this is where God's presence dwelt. And now theologically, I want to be careful. We know that God's presence is not confined to a little box, um, but in some way, his presence was made more fully experienced through this ark. 
It was to be treated with such respect that people who looked at it the wrong way, people who touched it on accident, they were killed. And so it's very significant here. This is God's presence here in this ark. And so the Israelites would take this ark with them into battle ahead of them as a reminder of who was fighting their battles for them, who was winning the battles. But as we see in the book of Judges, over time, time after time, the Israelites start to do what is right in their own eyes, and they start to turn away from God. And so here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 5, in, in the chapter before, the Philistines, their enemies, come and capture this ark. God allows this ark to be taken from them. His presence is no less powerful than before, obviously, but he has allowed his physical presence to be removed from the people of Israel because they've not followed him. And so that brings us to where we are here. 1 Samuel chapter 5, I will read. It says, When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon. I don't know how big it was, but, you know, put it back up in place, however many people it took to do that. But when they rose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground again before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both of his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. And so the hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So that's where Goliath is from, these warriors, giants. They brought the ark of the God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against that city, causing a very great panic, and he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They brought around to us the ark of God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent, therefore, and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of God, the God of Israel, and let it return to its own place, that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did, did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So here we are with this ark, this sign of God's presence, and everywhere it goes, people's lives are upended. <laughs> Those in Ashdod, they held very dearly to this God Dagon. They trusted in Dagon, and yet God proved himself more powerful. His presence was more powerful than the presence of Dagon. Those in Gath, these warriors, these giants, they trust in their health, their strength, and yet God comes in and afflicts them with tumors. Some people die. God proves himself to be stronger and more powerful than anything they valued. Everything they valued is proven to be worthless. And so what do the Philistines do? They put the ark on a cart, they attach a couple of cows to it, and send it on its way. And those cows head straight towards Israelite territory, and they ended up at a place called Kiriath Jerim for the next 20 years. But 20 years later, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, which I invite you to turn to as well, 2 Samuel chapter 6, um, as David becomes king over Israel, he decides he's going to bring the ark back to the Israelite, uh, to Jerusalem. And so as we look at 2 Samuel chapter 6, we're going to start together in verse 5 here. It says, And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down because of his error, and he died there because of the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. 
But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told to King David, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. So here we see kind of a different effect. God's presence in the family of Obed-Edom. There's blessing, uh, just abundant blessing here to him, Obed-Edom, and to his whole household. His life was transformed. His life was turned upside down by the presence of God. Because God's presence transforms lives. God's presence turns the world upside down. But... Here we are today, year 2022, and the presence of God is definitely not confined to an ark, to a box. Um, It's not confined to a temple made of bricks. It's not confined to a tabernacle. It's not confined to transform the lives of the Philistines for the worse or the lives of Obed-Edom for the better. Instead, Jesus' death, his resurrection, his gift of the Holy Spirit to us, to his followers, means that if you, any of you, if you are followers of Jesus Christ, you are a temple of God. You are like an ark of God. You contain his presence inside of you. His presence is manifest in you. And so as a church, we don't have this box where God's presence is that could get sent off to Kiriath Jerim for 20 years and have people forget about it. Or it could get sent to the Philistine territory and be only over there. It's not just blessing one family at a time. God's presence is manifest in you. And there's a couple verses here I just want to remind us of. 1 Corinthians 6.19, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? And because of that, We're told in Acts 1.8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we can take the presence of God into each of our communities, into each of our homes, into each of our workplaces, here and to the ends of the earth. And we can see the presence of Jesus transforming those communities, our workplaces, our homes, our families, here and to the ends of the earth because the presence of Jesus turns the world upside down. So again, our vision, our preferred future here for our church is to see our communities transformed by the presence of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. In the Gospels, the presence of Jesus casts out demons. The presence of Jesus brings healing. The presence of Jesus feeds 5,000 people with just a handful of loaves of bread. The presence of Jesus brings the dead to life. The presence of Jesus turns the world upside down. But more importantly, the presence of Jesus brings people into restored relationship with God. And so in Mark chapter 2, there's a story of a man, he's paralyzed, he can't Uh, move and so his friends have him on a mat and they're trying to get him to Jesus to be healed and Jesus is in a big crowd he's in a house they can't get to him and so what do they do they climb up on the roof of the house they dig a hole through the roof and they drop this man down through to Jesus and yet Jesus's first words to this man are not be healed they are not stand up and walk his first words to them to him is son your sins are forgiven Jesus understands that the most important thing, more than any physical healing, more than food, more than security, more than a temporary escape from death, what we really need in our communities, what we really need in our lives, is restoration from God, with God. It's forgiveness from our sins. And we, as the church, we as followers of Christ, as temples of God, have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have the presence of Jesus with us, and so we can bring that transformation, that restoration into our communities, not because of our power, but because of the presence of Jesus living inside of us. So whatever people in your community hold dear, whether it's Power, money, materialism, sex, gender, nationality, uh, materialism, I already said that one. Uh, The 
presence of Jesus has authority over it all. And the presence of Jesus can turn the world upside down. And so, taking some contemporary examples here, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, that does not have the power to fully transform a community. But Christ followers who demonstrate selfless love to hurting women and children, that can transform a community through the presence of Jesus. The changing of police structures or the changing of gun control laws or minimum wage or inflation or whatever the hot button issue is of the moment, political parties, whatever it is, none of these have the power to fully transform communities. But we as Christ followers have the Holy Spirit in us and we can see Jesus transform our communities. So that's our preferred future. That's where we're going. That's our vision, to see our communities transformed by the presence of Jesus. And so my question to you today is, are you ready to join us on this vision? Are you ready to bring Jesus' presence into your community? We've been taking steps over the last years, and the last year specifically toward this vision. We went through the art of neighboring together, reminding us to uh, build relationships, really challenging us to meet our neighbors, build relationships with them. And that was not a once and done kind of thing, but an ongoing process. Now that the weather's nice again, hopefully you're finding lots of opportunities to connect with your neighbors again and continuing that process of getting to know people in your community. We recently went through soul care. And uh, again, it's not a once and done thing, but it's a chance to continue to grow in our walk in Jesus Christ, to be transformed, to follow him more. It's part of our spiritual training. It's part of our preparation. It's working alongside Christ to see transformation in our own lives so that we can see transformation in our communities. And so last week we got to hear some presentations, some testimonies of how soul care has impacted some of your lives. And I'm sure there are many more stories, and I hope over the next year there will be many, many more. I'm going through soul care with a couple of guys. I feel like kind of a soul care baby at the moment. We just finished chapter one. Um, So still got a ways to go. Uh, But I'm seeking in my life a transformation that only God can provide. Only Jesus can provide that transformation in my life. And I want to see my community transformed, but I know that to do so, I need to see my own life transformed. I need to go into strict training like Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So I saw a video a few, maybe a month or so ago, about how the actors and actresses of the new Top Gun movie prepared to be a part of that movie. I haven't seen the movie, but um, at least as far as I understand, at least for some of those scenes, they're flying around in actual F-18s for some of those scenes in the movie. And so to prepare, they had to go through a lot of training. They started out in a single engine aircraft, uh, just a small little aircraft to kind of get their spatial awareness within an aircraft. And from that, they graduated up to a kind of medium-sized jet engine plane and from that they were then able to graduate up into the F-18s and because obviously the cockpit of an F-18 is fairly small uh, they couldn't have a camera crew there so they had to be trained in terms of how to operate the cameras and set those up and start and stop and whatever else at the right time Um, and then they had to be prepared for emergencies so they actually had to go through some of the same training the Navy goes through where they're buck strapped into a capsule and it is submerged in water and they have to be able to unbuckle and get out in time you know to uh, in case they had to eject from their airplane all that to say is by the time they were ready to film they were prepared they were ready their vision their direction their preferred future was to make a good film, you know, and be uh, prepared to fly these air, fly in these airplanes. Um, and they made a reality through their preparation. But compare that to somebody else. Uh, I heard a story about this man. It was, this was in March 2019. He was a mechanical engineer, so he worked on airplanes. But as a retirement gift, when he turned 64, his co-workers all got together and gave him this opportunity to fly on a jet plane, a French fighter jet. And so he's at the tarmac realizing what's going on. And the problem is 
He'd never flown on a plane before, never a uh, jet before, didn't want to, had never expressed interest in it. So he's standing off to the side of the plane. His heart is going 140 beats a minute even before he's on the plane. He is nervous, but feeling the social pressure, he climbs aboard. Um, unfortunately, some of those same preparations that I had just described for these people in the Top Gun movie were not taken for this guy. Um, so he's in there, he was apparently allowed to adjust some of his own equipment, so his oxygen mask wasn't on, his helmet wasn't strapped on, his seat belt was too loose, he, he was not prepared, his visor was up, um, and then they take off. Well, in, in a takeoff, you feel, you know, these G-forces, so he's feeling four Gs of pressure as he's taking off, and then as it levels out at 2,500 feet, he feels this negative G-force where he gets this feeling of weightlessness. And you can imagine if your seatbelt isn't tied tightly, that feeling of weightlessness would be a little disorienting and you might try to grab for something. And so what does he grab for? He reaches and grabs the ejection lever. <laughs> he pulls it and ejects out <laughs> of the airplane. And I know it sounds too crazy to be true, but I did, I found it on multiple sources, uh, you know, CNN being one of them. So I, I trust that this really happened. And apparently, when that happens, normally the pilot gets ejected also, but there was a malfunction, and he was able to still safely land the, fl land the plane with just a few cuts and scrapes from the, you know, the canopy above you explodes and, and into a bunch of shards when, when you eject. But this guy, he's launched out, his helmet flies off because, his, you know, it's not strapped on. Obviously, he was not prepared for his journey. So if you're going to go on a fighter jet... There's kind of two paths you could take. You could take the path that these actors and actresses took in Top Gun, or you could take the path of this guy. Um, I'd recommend strapping on your helmet and having your oxygen mask ready, having your seatbelt tightened. I would recommend going through the training. And similarly, if we are going to see transformation in our communities, we need to make sure we're prepared. Uh, we need to make sure we're inviting Jesus to transform our own lives and diligently seeking him with everything we have. So I want to see our communities transformed by the presence of Jesus. I want to see the lives of the people around me transformed, and to do so I want to see my own life transformed as well. And so that, at the start of my message I told us, you know, we're going on a journey, so buckle in, strap in your belongings. Hopefully that analogy starts to make a little more sense here because this is the direction we're going to be going. We're going on a journey together, and that means putting ourselves through more and more rigorous training. That means continue jump, continuing to jump into caring for our souls. It means continuing to develop relationships with our neighbors. It means confessing from sin and ter repenting, turning from our sinful ways. It means seeking deliverance from anything that is keeping us from Jesus. We need our lives turned upside down. We need transformation. We need the presence of Jesus in our lives so that we can see the presence of Jesus in our communities bring transformation. And it's not going to be smooth sailing. Paul and Silas, as I described them at the beginning, uh, they were beaten and put in jail. They were threatened to the point of death. Most of Jesus' initial disciples, they were martyred. When Jesus cast out demons from a man and into a herd of pigs, the people of that area begged him to leave. But while we may experience some suffering and pain, we will also see people being healed. We will see people being encouraged. We will see people, most importantly, being restored into relationship with God. And so some here today have been following Christ for years and years and years and years and years. And I have so much to learn from following your example of Christ-likeness in your life but I know that in my life, there's so much more transformation still to come. I know I've not experienced all that Christ has to offer. And I know that nobody here online or right here in the service here has experienced all that Christ has to offer. And so I want us all together to commit to walking in the presence of Jesus, to seeking transformation in our lives, to seeking the transformation he offers to allowing Jesus to first turn our lives upside down so we can see him turn the world upside down. So, if anyone would like to stay after the service and pray for God to do a transforming work in your life, I and others will be up here and would love 
to pray with you toward that end. Or if you're watching online, there would be people here this week who would be happy to connect with you in prayer. But there may be others of you here who've never experienced that presence of Jesus, but you know you need his presence in your life. And if that's you, again, I just encourage you, take, take some time after the service, come up, let us pray with you toward that end to meet Jesus and experience his presence. For all of us, let's just take a moment and think about where we need to see transformation in our own lives. And as we see our lives individually transformed and as a church see our church transformed, May we see our communities transformed by the presence of Jesus. Let me pray. Lord, I really do need you to turn my life upside down. I need you to bring transformation. And I know others here will echo that prayer. We need you in our lives. We need you to bring transformation. And Lord, we desire greatly to see transformation in our communities as well. So I pray, Lord, that you would use us. I pray that you would change us, strengthen us, help us to not uh, grow weary in the training, to not skip the steps that we need to take whether it be repenting from some sin or seeking deliverance, Lord, help us to just follow you with our whole hearts and to trust you to transform our lives and then help us to see you at work in our communities bringing transformation. We thank you that you're not limited to one place or another, but that somehow you dwell inside of us as Christ followers if we are Christ followers. And for those who aren't Christ followers, Lord, I just pray that you would be drawing them to you. I pray that you would bring them to you. Lord, I pray that we would see our communities transformed by the presence of Jesus. And we thank you for just the encouraging uh, news of the last week of uh, you know, the number of Bibles that were given out being exactly what people needed, Lord. And we just pray for more and more opportunities to see you at work around us in our communities. I pray you'd give us courage. It is challenging to talk to people about things that maybe they disagree with. And we saw from Paul and Silas, they were thrown in jail. They were not treated well. And so it can be scary, but I pray you'd give us boldness. Boldness to bring to light the things in our lives that need to be brought to light. Boldness to see you at work in our lives. And then boldness as we go out into our communities. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to celebrate communion right now. If you do not have a communion cup, please feel free to raise your hand and someone can bring you the tray for you to choose from. Today we're going to be doing things a, a little bit differently. I'm going to be reading a short devotional, actually, that was uh, in this morning, a, a book by Paul David Tripp called New Morning Mercies. It was particularly striking for me. Once I'm done reading the devotional, we're just going to go to a time of preparing our hearts, preparing your cups. Remember to open up the uh, wafer side first. It says this. Stop trying to earn something from God. Stop trying to gain more of his acceptance. Stop trying to earn his favor. Stop trying to win his allegiance. Stop trying to do something that would pay for his blessing. Stop trying to morally buy your way out of his anger. Stop trying to reach a level where you will know lasting peace with him. Just stop trying. Paul wipes out this distorted, debilitating, buy your way into grace culture with a striking economy of words. Galatians 3.11 says, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. He goes on, he says this, It is a statement that requires no preamble, 
and no amendment. No one is ever accepted by God because he or she has kept the law. No one. That's it. No compromises and no deals are needed. Christ did not make the first payment on your moral mortgage. He paid your entire moral mortgage in one single payment so that you could live in relationship to God debt-free forever. So just try, so stop trying to measure up to get whatever from God. Stop hiding from him when you mess up. Stop comparing yourself to other people, wondering if God loves you less because you're not as, quote-unquote, good as them. Just stop asking the law to do what only grace can achieve and start resting in the fact that you don't have any moral bills due because Jesus paid them all on the cross. And when you sin, don't pretend you didn't. Don't panic and don't hide. Run to Jesus and receive mercy in your time of need, the kind of mercy he paid for you to have. So Rose Hill Alliance Church, and if you're online today with us, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this is for you. This isn't about trying or to earn God's favor. This is about receiving and accepting and celebrating with us as the body of Christ at Rose Hill what Jesus Christ has completed on the cross. So at this point, I'm going to stop talking. I'll come up and I'll read scripture in just a couple moments. But prepare your hearts, prepare your cups. Go to Jesus and run to him. Don't hide. Run to Jesus. Whatever's been going on in your life, run to Jesus. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, the body of Christ, broken for you. Also he took the cup after supper, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ poured out for you. Lord Jesus, we proclaim your death. We thank you, Father. We thank you that you willingly gave your Son. We thank you that we can rest. We don't have to try, but we can come before you because we know that we already have grace. So we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We thank you for dying for us. We thank you that your body was broken. We thank you that your blood was shed. We thank you. Thank you for your goodness. So in this rest, we look to you now, today, and for the rest of this week, we look to you, Lord Jesus, trusting that the debt's been canceled, it's been paid, we are forgiven. If we are in you, we've received you by faith, we are forgiven. Father, I pray that as we go as transformed people today, as we go into our workplaces, into our neighborhoods, as we go to the places that we hang out, as we go into our homes, with our families, with our friends, even as we go into celebration early this week, Lord Jesus Christ, we bring your presence and we thank you. We thank you, Father, that we can carry that presence. Would you bring transformation in and through us, corporately and individually, Jesus? We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Day Church. As you go today, one thing we forgot to mention, please grab one of the life boxes that are out there. Please don't play Minnesota nice and leave it for someone else. Fight for them. Take one of the boxes and pray for one of the kids throughout the entire week. Pray for Lizzie, pray for Molly, pray for Christina, and take the greatness of God with you. Take the presence of Jesus for the transformation of your communities. Have a great week. Bless you.